Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, March 21st. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. Uh, we're going to start today with a proclamation recognizing natural, uh, National Agriculture Day. It's natural as well. Uh, and that is by Council Members Friedson, Balcom, and Rudke. Well, good morning, or uh, as uh, all of our farmers here would say, uh, good midday. Uh, but uh, it's really great to be here to be able to celebrate the ag community. Uh, Jeremy, Chris, Doug Lechleiter, Marcy Gormitanu, uh, who are here, and lots of members of the agriculture community. I'd like to call you all up uh, to join us. Whoever would like to join, feel free. Um, but uh, really excited to be here with uh, my two new colleagues who represent the Agricultural Reserve, uh, Marilyn Balcom and Don Lukey. It was an honor uh, and a privilege to be able to represent the Agricultural Reserve in District 1 for the past four years. It's an honor to be able to serve as the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee Chair uh, that oversees uh, agriculture uh, on the County Council. Uh, and I'm just incredibly excited to be able to celebrate our ag community in Montgomery County. Uh, an ag industry that in Maryland represents 6,000 full-time farmers, contributes more than $8 billion to the Maryland economy, and employs more than 350,000 Marylanders. The Agricultural Reserve is the most important land conservation decision, not only in Montgomery County, but perhaps anywhere in the United States of America. It has been a model for smart growth, it has been a model for agricultural preservation. It has been a model that we all take very seriously here, that we are going to continue to protect uh, and to preserve. It's part of what makes Montgomery County so special, ensures that we have the urban, the suburban, and the rural that make Montgomery County such a great place to live and to raise a family. And we're so lucky to be joined here by so many different farmers, so many different farm families, so many different individuals who represent everything that agriculture is in Montgomery County. Uh, and I'm just so grateful uh, to be able to be here uh, with you to celebrate uh, this important day. So I want to call up uh, my colleagues uh, here first before a couple or a few guest speakers, and then we'll read the proclamation. But with that, let me turn to uh, Marilyn Balcom. Thank you, uh, Council Member Friedson. Not only is the Agricultural Reserve an important environmental asset in Montgomery County, but it's also an important economic driver. With over well over 500 farms, our agricultural industry adds to our vibrant economy. Our farms are active in food production, commodity grain production, horticulture, livestock, and in the equine industry. Our farmers also support many farm-to-table programs, including farmers markets, community-supported agriculture, roadside stands, and many pick-your-own opportunities for our community. I live in Germantown, and I feel blessed that I can be in the Ag Reserve within 10 minutes. Whether it's strawberry picking, apple picking, taking a hay ride to the pumpkin patch, or being a part of a community-supported agriculture, my, uh, many of the farms in my community have been integral to my family as my daughter was growing up and, and for me now on the weekends. Today is a great reminder as to how important farming is to our community. The farms support us and nurture us, and we have to do the same. Farming is a business, and we need to make sure that our farms are economically viable. I thank you all for coming, and I'm so proud uh, to be your representative uh, for many of you on the council. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. And I know today is the 50th anniversary of National Agriculture Day. Started in 1973. And I like to think a lot of good things happened in 1973. Um, <laughs> as noted by my colleagues, our Ag Reserve and our farmers here in Montgomery County are a vital part of our community and directly contribute to our health and well-being. We grow produce, livestock, commodity crops, turf grass, grapes for wine, barley and hops for beer, and let us not forget our cideries, and an impressive range of products. And many of those folks are here with us today to celebrate. 
Fun fact, many people probably don't know that Montgomery County holds the distinction of having the most acres planted in berries of any county in Maryland. And farmers practicing sustainable agriculture also, so, also support the well-being of our planet. So we have been leading the way in these initiatives here in Montgomery County. They do things like planting cover crops, use integrated pest management systems, and have solar panel farms, for example, like the cattle pastures um, that power the milking parlor at Rock Hill Orchard. It's really important that we continue to support the Ag Reserve and recognize the, the vision that folks had back in uh, the 1980s to set this aside so that we can build a bridge for the next generation of farmers. And I'm especially excited to see members from the new generation of ag leaders like Anvita Devella, who's here with us today. And uh, she's a freshman at Damascus High School. Um, and I want to thank you for all that you're doing to represent agriculture amongst our students here in MCPS. Thank you all for the work you do to support our communities, our quality of life environmentally and economically. Thank you. Let's hear it again for Envita. We have a lot of ag leaders here today. We're very fortunate. Uh, we have three speakers who are going to join us. Uh, we're going to start with uh, somebody who has been absolutely essential and instrumental to the county council and the county's work in the ag community, Jeremy Chris, who has been uh, an advisor. He has been a confidant. He has been somebody who has lifted up the ag community voices to make sure uh, that the issues facing farmers, particularly going through some of the most challenging times over the last several years, are elevated here at the County Council. And so with that, I just want to turn it over to Jeremy Chris. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. It's always a tremendous opportunity to showcase agriculture in Montgomery County and this day, National Agriculture Day, is definitely one that we can be proud of the farmers that are behind me as well as all the farmers that we have in the county. I've been blessed and privileged to work with the farm community for my career and I just have a lot of memories and I know that it's a tremendous community to work for and they're going to be in, in good hands. I'll, I'll be retiring it towards the end of the year and so we've got uh, some plans for um, moving the Office of Agriculture forward, but um, today is uh, really important for us to focus on agriculture as a whole, the farmers that are behind me, as well as all the farmers in the county. And thank you very much, Andrew, and the County Council for this opportunity to showcase agriculture. Thank you, Jeremy. Obviously, big shoes to fill. If the Ag uh, Reserve is going to be environmentally sustainable, it has to be economically sustainable as well. And Jeremy Chris never lets us forget that. Another person who never lets us forget that is Doug Lechleiter, one of the great ag leaders that uh, we have. And uh, with that, uh, Doug, if you could share a few remarks. Good morning. You guys really did your homework. I don't have anything to say. <laughs> said at all. But it is an honor to be here and to be able to represent the vast Montgomery County ag sector. Again, my name is Doug Lackleiter. I'm a farmer in Laytonsville. We grow corn, wheat, soybeans, and sod along with my wife and son. I'm the current chair of the Montgomery County Ag Advisory, Agriculture Advisory Committee. And I'm here to say that ag is alive and well in Montgomery County. Uh, I'm not gonna go through these ag facts because they've already been hit, but I will say I want to say that Montgomery County is some of the most innovative farmers in the country. One of the first in the nation to implement no-till farming, which drastically reduced uh, soil erosion. We do contour farming. We do precision farming. We use GPS with variable rate fertilizer applications. We have new sprayers coming out in the future that will use photo cells, and they'll only spray where there's weed. I mean, uh, and Montgomery County will be in the forefront of that. We have ag entertainment, ag breweries, ag tourism, equestrian centers. We have pick your own. We have creameries with ice cream. Anything happening in the state of Maryland is happening in Montgomery County, only we do it better. <laughs> no one sector dominates any of this. 
it's it's a group effort. And as I mentioned earlier, ag is alive and well. Farming is a business, and it evolves with the market. As the market changes, farmers will adapt to continue to be profitable and viable. And we hope we can continue to work with this county council, which has been a blessing in the past, with these changes to foster an environment where Montgomery County farmers can successfully fill the needs of the community and the country. Thank you. I know how innovative it is. When I went out uh, to the Ag Reserve a couple of years ago, I went up on a combine, and uh, I was told, don't worry, we pre-programmed -pro for it. Even you can't screw this up. So uh, uh, it certainly has uh, taken agriculture to a whole new level here uh, in Montgomery County with innovation. Uh, but with that, I uh, want to introduce another uh, ag leader, Marcy Guaramatanu, uh, who is here with us. And uh, please, if you could share a few remarks. I don't know if I'm an ag leader, I would dispute that. <laughs> so you hear that I have an accent is from Dickerson. <laughs> I was actually born in Zimbabwe and I moved to the United States in 1998. Uh, never in my wildest dreams did I think I would ever become a farmer. And it actually really did happen by accident. I was looking for a place to do something else and this farm came as, a, as an opportunity. And so um, my sister and I bought this farm if you, to, in 2020, uh, in fall of 2020. And we, uh, this is one of the greatest decisions that we ever made. So as a farmer, I've discovered a few things that you need to know a lot of things. You become a scientist. You need to know about the soil. You need to know about the climate, um, the atmosphere, atmospheric um, changes and all those things. So um, it's been challenging, but it's good. Uh, you also become a laborer. You know, you work hard, uh, lots of effort, and um, it's very labor. Farming is very labor intensive, so therefore that's why it's not attractive to everyone. So kudos to all these people that do this daily. Uh, you also become a marketer, so you need to learn about the market and the people that you are supplying uh, your. Um, your, your produce. You also become a finance guru. That is how to work hard and still not make money. <laughs> um, but it is very rewarding. And for me, the reason why I say it is very rewarding is that we provide uh, some of our produce to Mana Foods. And we've also just made a new contact with uh, Jen that's here. So we Community from from share correct. So we, you know, so one of the things that happened last um, last summer, I went to drop off food at uh, some ki uh, some community kitchens, and I saw very long lines of people waiting to be fed, and also long lines of people coming to collect food. I think that made it very rewarding for me to know that I'm part of this. I'm part of the solution. So I think to everybody that's here, that's standing here, and those that are not here, they are really doing a great service to the community. Uh, I wouldn't, our journey has been um, made possible because of um, these farmers. I turn back to a lot of these people to ask for help, and they never say no. So thank you to all of them. But one of the big challenges that we face is labor. I'm really a one person farm. <laughs> and so I don't know how we can resolve that. So hopefully, um, as we continue to have discussions, we'll find solutions. Thank you very much. Well, I think we'll all dispute. Uh, uh, Marcy absolutely is an agricultural leader and a farm leader. And we're really grateful to have you here today. Uh, we're very grateful to have everybody here we've, we've hit the educational element, we've hit the farm to food bank element, the family supporting uh, aspect of the economic role uh, of, of uh, agriculture, and now we're gonna read a proclamation to bring it all together. So if my colleagues could join me, um, we have a proclamation from the County Council of Montgomery County, whereas this year marks the 50th anniversary of National Agriculture Day, created in 1973, a very important year to recognize and celebrate the vital role our agricultural stewards play in nurturing and protecting natural resources 
while enriching our daily lives with their harvests. And whereas Montgomery County Agricultural Community encompasses more than 500 farms with more than 10,000 people employed and more than $280 million in annual contributions to our local economy and whereas the agriculture and natural resources sector has seen the largest job growth rate by percentage over the last five years with the number of jobs in the sector growing by 239 percent and Whereas, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, agricultural producers continued to innovate. New agriculture operations opened their doors, contributing to more opportunities for nonprofit partners to work with local farmers to provide fresh and affordable food to our most vulnerable populations while reducing food waste and... Whereas, our farmers and agricultural producers consistently win awards for their products and services serve in leadership roles in state and national organizations, and are the driving force behind one of the nation's largest volunteer-run fairs, the Montgomery County Agricultural Fair, and whereas during National Agriculture Day and every day, Montgomery County residents can admire the agricultural reserve and the professionals who have dedicated their time and efforts to making it the jewel it is today. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby celebrates National Agriculture Day and honors those in the agricultural industry for the vital role they have in our economy and supports the continuation of our county's farming heritage and culture. We commit to serving our county's farmers in the same spirit of service through which they tirelessly grow, care for, and provide for Montgomery County. Signed this 21st day of March in the year 2023 by myself, Andrew Friedson, and Council Members Marilyn Balcom and Don Lukey. Congratulations. Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. We are now going to do our own little crop rotation here and move on to general business. You see what I did there? There we go. Yeah, I'm getting mixed reviews from the audience. Um, so, uh, we're now going to go to general business. Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements? Good morning, Council President, Council Vice President, Council Members. We have a few announcements today. Recommended and potential amendments to the FY24 capital budget and the FY23 to 28 capital improvements program and the FY24 operating budget have been pro proposed. The amendments will be included in the operating budget public hearings on April 11th and April 13th, 2023 at 1.30 p.m and 7 p.m. The council is seeking applicants to fill two full-time vacancies on the Montgomery County Planning Board, 
one of which will serve full time as the planning board chair. Application deadline is April 3rd, 2023 at 5 p.m. Please visit the council website for details. Finally, the Montgomery County Council is accepting applications for membership on the county's Charter Review Commission. The deadline for applications for the four-year appointment has been extended to 5 p.m. on Monday, April 3rd, 2023. Again, please visit the council website for details. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And I just want to elevate the last point you made about uh, applicants for the Charter Review Commission. Uh, for those who care about county government and operations, please consider being a part of the Charter Review Commission. Uh, the clerk has circulated the minutes for March 1st, 2023. Are there any changes? Not hearing any. Those are approved. Okay. Uh, second item on the agenda, we're now going to sit as the district council. And today, the district council will be discussing uh, a hearing examiner recommended recommendation of a local map amendment application number H-147 for property located at uh, 11105 New Hampshire Avenue in Silver Spring, uh, further identified as part of lot E in the White Oak subdivision recorded as plat number 8280, which has requested rezoning from CR 2.5, C1.5, R1.5, H200 to CRTF 2.25, C2.25, R1.5, and H200. Ms. Nadeau, I'm going to turn it over to you for more of the details. Good morning, Council. Um, so first, I want to make a quick correction uh, to the request for the rezoning. Um, so it says CRTF 2.5. There was an inconsistency between the application and the exhibits. It should be CRTF 2.5. Um, that's what the hearing examiner Yes, correct. So CRTF 2.5, and that is what the analysis was based on, and the planning board's recommendation, as well as the hearing examiner's recommendation. So that's the actual rezoning number um, that the council will be considering. Um, I know this is this council's first local map amendment, so as a quick refresher, um, what's going to happen is our hearing examiner, Ms. Byrne, uh, who I believe this is our first LMA before this council, um, will be giving a quick overview of her report and recommendation. Um, and then the resolution that is in the package it is based on that recommendation, so it's for approval of the application. If any council member disagrees, they can make a motion um, to either remand or disapprove the application, and then we'll come back in the following week so council staff has time to draft a new resolution. Um, so the applicant is proposing to use the property to continue self-storage as well as expand their existing structure. And there are certain factors that the council has to look to in deciding whether to approve this application. That's on the second page of the cover sheet for the packet. And summing those up very quickly, um, it's one that the application conforms with the recommendations of the master plan, general plan, and other county plans, furthers public interest, satisf satisfies the intent and standards of the proposed zone, is compatible with existing and approved adjacent development, and generates traffic that does not exceed critical lane volume or volume capacity ratio under the planning board's LATR guidelines. So with that, I'm here for any questions. Otherwise, I will turn it over to Ms. Byrne. Ms. Byrne, good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Uh, just to, again, the address was previously stated as 11105 New Hampshire Avenue, Silver Spring, Maryland. It's located within the White Oak subdivision. The owner is seeking to rezone the property in order to expand an existing self-storage use. Uh, the report and recommendation that I've prepared and is in your packet provides um, specific compliance details on the rezoning. But in short, the proposed rezoning meets the requirements of the zoning ordinance and is in conformance with the master plan. The changes, really, the use itself does not change. So the underlying use remains the same. What's happening is the existing building is receiving reinvestment, redevelopment, a facelift in the rear of the property. They're adding a brand new building for internal storage and it will remove the existing vehicle storage in the back. Um, 
the it's compatible with the surrounding uses also included in your packet are the binding elements that the use is limited to self storage maximum square footage of 234,800 square feet car access to the site is limited to the existing entry on New Hampshire Avenue and the maximum building height will not exceed 55 feet um, and as Levu stated earlier there was a typo in my report and recommendation it is the new zone is CRTF 2.5 not 2.25 so I just want to make sure that that was clear on the record that's what the analysis was done under and if you have any questions I'm here to answer them thank you uh, colleagues are there any questions okay not hearing any colleagues are there any motions I'll move to approve uh, as recommended by, uh, moved by councilmember Lukey second uh, seconded by Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, uh, roll call vote. Thank you. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernos? Yes. Councilmember Albernos votes yes. Councilmember Duando? Yes. Councilmember Duando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friedson? Yes. Councilmember Friedson votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you both, Ms. Byrne and Ms. Nadu. And uh, also want to make an announcement while we are sitting as the district council that the council will hold a public hearing on the planning board draft amendment to the master plan for the historic preservation for the Edward U. Taylor Elementary School and Weller's dry cleaning on April 25th, 2023 at 1.30 in the afternoon. Okay. Now on to item number three, legislative day number nine. There are a number of bills uh, that will be introduced and are being called on for final reading. The first uh, bill for introduction is Bill 1723, Taxation, Re Recordation Tax Rates Amendments. Lead sponsor is Councilmember Mink and co-sponsor is Councilmember Jawando. A public hearing is scheduled for April 11th at 1.30 in the afternoon. A geo committee work session will be scheduled for a later date. Councilmember Mink. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to make sure that the public understands what the recordation tax is uh, and why I believe we as a community should consider raising the rates. Um, so what is a recordation tax? Where does the money go? Home buyers pay a one-time recordation tax based on the sale price when they purchase a property in Montgomery County. And recordation tax revenues go towards general county operations, general county capital projects like roads and public safety facilities, rental assistance, and MCPS capital projects. So that's school construction and renovations. The recordation tax is, in fact, by far the largest source of tax revenue for school construction and renovation projects. And this proposal to raise rates is about our schools and specifically whether we're going to ensure that young people in Montgomery County get to attend school in safe, adequate facilities. This is about whether or not we're going to keep MCPS projects on time. Because what has become clear is that there is a large gap between projected revenues and the amount of funding needed for school construction in the coming years. Inflation, competition with transportation projects, and past council actions to reduce development impact taxes this has created a perfect storm. Last week in the Education and Culture Committee, we had to take a very realistic look at MCPS's non-recommended but potentially necessary cuts. And what we saw was that urgently needed projects, which will become more expensive if delayed, are on the chopping block. And it was also noted in committee that if we don't adjust our trajectory, we're likely to be back at that cutting board next year. Many NC MCPS projects that will be up for consideration again next year, a full CIP year, have not gone out for bid, and so we'll likely see large cost increases due to inflation. 
So while I think it's important to be clear and honest that passing a recordation tax increase does not guarantee that any one individual school project will stay on schedule, it is certainly safe to say that it will dramatically increase our chances of starting and finishing many important projects on time. This bill is projected to raise over $200 million for school construction and renovation projects over the next five years. The other aspect of this that my colleagues and I will have to weigh as we consider this proposal is the impact it will have on home buyers. The new rates in this bill would mean that the buyer of a half million dollar house would pay roughly $1,100 more in recordation taxes, or a 1% increase in cash to close, assuming a 20% down payment. That is not a trivial amount, and I know we are all well aware and concerned about the cost of housing in our area. I also believe that anyone buying a home in the county has a stake in the quality of our public schools, starting with the condition of the school buildings. I look forward to further discussion on this proposal as we move into our work on the budget. I see this as a starting point, absolutely open to debate and amendments as we hear from the community, and this goes to committee. But I hope we can stay focused on what our young people need and deserve, schools we can all be proud of. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield back. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and, and thank you, Councilmember Mink, for uh, since we're in tournament season, you know, taking the outlet pass and and pushing it up the field. You haven't scored yet, but we're going to work on that. Um, this is something I think context is really important when we have our discussions. Uh, the previous council, when we worked on the growth now growth and infrastructure policy, uh, formerly the subdivision staging policy. Uh, made a decision to increase or reduce rather impact taxes, which were also a big driver and funder of school construction, because uh, the stated goal, which I think we all share, that we wanted to encourage more production of housing. Um, and that was the discussion. At the same time, the sponsors of that change also uh, put forward a recordation tax proposal to backfill because obviously you didn't want to take money from school construction without backfilling it uh, and there was a bill that was pending until the end of the council and was never taken up um, it's something that we have to do these are structural uh, issues with the CIP um, and I think Councilmember Mink stated it well that there are projects uh, normally in the CIP and we've gone through a couple now I have we're talking about well, what are the new projects that we have to delay or what can we not add? This is a discussion of what are we not going to do that we said we were going to do, in some cases for multiple years. Um, and because of the cost escalation, because of uh, the increase or lack of availability of, of uh, resources, this is a discussion about will we do what we promised to do in some very significant programs. Um, as was mentioned in the ENC committee this week, we took action to uh, reluctantly uh, acknowledge that some of the non-recommended cuts might have to be uh, accepted if there is not new revenue and the situation doesn't change. On that same, the, the, the day before we re received the budget and we know that there's even more of a write down of recordation taxes based on uh, the interest rates of home sales going up. So uh, I think the point that this is a starting point is, is the important point. Uh, we have to structurally fix this issue of what's coming into the CIP for not just schools, uh, but also for the Housing Initiative Fund and also for rental assistance, which is part of uh, what's funded, but primarily in this instance for schools. Um, the aging buildings, the testimony that we heard during the CIP uh, uh, public hearings and that we'll hear during the budget, I'm sure, uh, we all have to agree that every student deserves to be in a functional, safe, and, and clean school. Um, and it's just not the case today. And there's really important projects in this CIP uh, that if we don't take action, this won't solve all of our problems, but it will certainly help us uh, and prevent us from having to come back again next year in a full CIP and make even tougher decisions. Um, I understand that some are concerned uh, about increasing this fee or tax at this time. Uh, I think this is the time to do it. We have a record uh, deficit in our school construction budget. We have an operating budget that we have to meet the needs for our schools. Uh, these things go hand in hand. 
Um, and uh, I think one of the points I wanted to point out about the bill that it does it in a progressive way. Um, this is not uh, the lower income house that you have, sir, or you are, um, and co colleagues can read this and we can go through it, but it's a lower fee uh, depending on the size of the house. And, and I think that's important as well, which is already built in the recordation tax, but we continue that tradition here. So look forward to the discussions in GO, but this is really a critical component to making sure that we keep our promises and fund con school construction and do what we said we were going to do when we took that funding, the previous council, out of the CIP. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and that bill has now been introduced. Moving on to a call of bills for final reading. Uh, first bill is Bill 2522, Forest Conservation Trees. The Transportation and Environment Committee recommends enactment with amendments. Uh, I will say for colleagues that this bill was originally introduced last summer and it received a public hearing on October 4th of last fall and then because of the elections and because of the majority new council that we have I thought everybody would benefit from having another public hearing and so we had another one a second one on February 7th and then the t and &E committee had a work session later that month and the purpose of this bill is to expand the types of areas that our trees can be protected uh, and make sure that we have reforestation in all parts of the county as we continue to grow um, and this will be good for all of us moving forward and particularly particularly our environment Ms. Wellens are there any additional comments you have uh, thank you mr. president and good morning council members um, correct so before you is bill 25-22 uh, for final action there are a couple of potential additional amendments for um, the council's consideration mr. president um, that came in after the TNE committee uh, recommendation to enact the bill with amendments. As you know, the t and &E committee um, adopted several amendments um, in order to expand um, the types of priority areas that deserve protection to include floodplains and stream buffers and uh, to account for, uh, to increase the ratios when, when uh, variances are given in those instances for the, um, for the floodplains and stream buffers. Um, also made some technical clarifications. Um, subsequently, um, the planning board staff did request um, an amendment uh, from the full council, which is to make the bill um, expedited. This would allow the, uh, obviously allow the law to go into effect sooner and thus allow the Department of Natural Resources at the state level to review our forced um, mitigation plans on a more expedited basis. We also have Ms. Teddy and Ms. Um, Sorrento from the planning department staff should council members have any question about that request. Thank you. Council Member Stewart. That was fast. <laughs> thank you. Um, I just want to first thank everyone for all their hard work on this. Um, as council president said, this is uh, was introduced um, and been through um, a great deal of uh, discussion and revisions and I think it, it is a great example of the coming together of uh, different departments in the county and residents uh, to arrive at where we are here today. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that we have three county laws um, that look at our trees here. We have the forest conservation law, which we're talking about today the tree canopy law and the roadside um, safety law, um, all of which we um, need to work on for improvements to achieve our net zero forest loss. Um, but today we're looking at the forest conservation law and as the planning board chair stated, although we are approaching no net loss of forest now, more can be done. These current amendments are proposed to achieve even greater forest planting and forest conservation in Montgomery County with the goal of achieving an equal or greater area of forest planted than forest removed on a countywide level by projects subject to the Montgomery County Forest Conservation Law. And I just want to say um, again, thank you to everyone. Um, I support the um, amendments proposed by staff and would like to get this moving forward today. 
Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. And, uh, thank you. Uh, and I want to echo my, the comments of my colleague, uh, Councilmember Stewart. Uh, this is an important bill. Uh, and, it, and it will have an impact, uh, a big impact on, on our uh, development community. And uh, so I would, I would say that the expediting the bill, uh, it will be difficult for, for people who are looking at projects and getting projects underway. So I would not support the expedited effective date. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. I feel terrible because I know I have to speak on these amendments, which I agree with, but I wanted to make a general comment. Should I wait? Or should I just say now? Well, no one has put any amendments forward, so we're just speaking oh, about the general. Oh, so the, the comments you said. Well, two things. One, and I don't remember if I said this before or not, but when I was on the planning board a few years ago, I asked Christina, who's sitting in the back, um, to work on this. And it's awesome that I got elected and now I'm about to vote on this. So it just proves that things take time. And, uh, and I honestly believe in my heart this is the right thing to do. I do have um, a request outside this bill. I don't think it should be an amendment unless you disagree with me. I recently visited um, the dog vulture farm in Knob County and uh, they have basically a naturally regenerated forest. And I was wondering if, um, I think it would be great if the planning board can do a report on um, how the naturally regenerated forest can work in Montgomery County in terms of the forest bank. Um, so that shouldn't be part of this bill unless the planning board in the future, once they do the report, they think it should be amended with their findings. Um, so that that's something that I would love for you guys to work on at some point. That's all. Other than that, I'm very proud. Thank you, Councilmember Jawanda. Thank you, and uh, I also just want to say this is a really good moment. I'm glad you're here to vote on it, Councilmember Franny Gonzalez. Um, this is a real important uh, piece of legislation for the well-being of our environment, our communities, and future generations. We all know that in the, on the previous council, or two previous councils, we declared climate change a, an emergency, and we took steps in the last council to implement and put forward money to decide how, what are the things we should do to uh, end the climate plan to act on this present reality. Uh, the extreme weather events uh, we've experienced are a stark reminder of, of the many dangers posed uh, by our increasing climate. Uh, and the policies that have eroded our forests for decades are a big part of that. Our, they are a natural defense uh, to extreme weather, and it's our responsibility to protect and support them. So I just want to thank uh, the Montgomery County Forest Coalition, including uh, uh, Denise Gutierrez and Kit Gage, the MoCo Climate Action Plan Coalition, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the Friends of Ten Mile Creek, and many, many others. Your advocacy has been instrumental in bringing this issue to the forefront. We've received the most emails this term, I think, on this issue. Uh, it shows that how important and how uh, great that work has been. Uh, the previous council, we didn't uh, address this, and your efforts have made sure that we took stepped up and did it today. Um, I'm also really happy to uh, read this packet uh, and that one of our county bills could be changed by pending state legislation uh, by Delegate Sarah Love and uh, Senator Elfrith, uh, who are working to enact a statewide Conservation Forest Act bill, which we should all be proud of and will increase our tree canopy even more. So I look forward to supporting this today, and I know that working together we can protect our forests and, 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 and make sure that we have a more greener and more uh, better approach to our climate emergency. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you. Just a quick question. So I look forward to voting for this. This is important, and um, I know that it's going to make a big impact uh, long term. But on Councilmember Balcom's point, um, Ms. Wallens, could you just describe the difference between not moving forward with expedited versus moving forward with expedited and how this would impact? Because I am sensitive to projects that may already be in the queue um, that may be impacted by this. Um, correct, certainly. So that and making the bill expedited would mean that it would take effect on the day that it is signed into law by the county executive. Uh, by contrast, if uh, the council does not alter the bill to become expedited, it will take effect um, 
90 days after um, it's signed by the county executive. Thank you. Uh, just speaking for myself, I think 90 days is not unreasonable um, just to allow folks to process and onboard this very important piece of legislation. So I would support um, not expediting it. If somebody wants to make a motion, I don't know where others are, obviously, but um, just that's my feeling on that part of it. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart. Great. Just following up on um, that request, could you, um, Ms. Wellens, just state again why the staff is recommending the to expedite this or Christine? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we probably we could have, have planning board to staff for, yeah. planning to hear from staff. the experts directly. Yeah. Hey. Good morning, Christina Sorrento for the record. Uh, the reason why we're asking for it to be expedited is because of the state bills that are in play right now. We don't know whether they're going to actually go forward or not at, at this moment, but if they do, um, we wanted to make sure that we had the county law in place because that gives us priority with the Department of Natural Resources to make sure that we can be approved as an alternative approach rather than taking what's in the state law, which is more prohibitive. Great, thank you. That, that, that is what um, you mentioned when we were in the committee meeting. I appreciate that. So I would like to formally move the amendment um, to expedite this bill. Second. Uh, moved by Councilmember Stewart, seconded by Councilmember Jawando. Any discussion? Sorry, uh, yes. Council Member Rappel. Um, thank you. And, and I, I, that was a long discussion that we had in the committee. Um, I was under the impression that if, as long as we passed the bill, if we passed the bill today, that would suffice for um, the preempting the state and, and not when it went into effect. That part is a little bit of a, a gray area. So it, it might be it might be enough. I we're not clear on that. So we just wanted to I, we were just trying to cross our T's and dot our I's basically. Okay. Thank you. So I think uh, Councilmember uh, Balcom brings up a good question. Uh, at the Transportation and Environment Committee, we did discuss this, and we did discuss the state law and which law would prevail. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're taking this up today, presumably passing it, uh, we would seek a legal opinion. I, I think that's what a consensus is, is asking for, is whether or not if this is passed today and, say, the county executive signs it tomorrow, would that pr prevail over any state law, even though the enactment does not come into play for 90 days or so. Ms. Wellens? The, the proposed effective date, as I understand it, for the state law, obviously subject to amendment, would be is July 2024? That's correct, yeah, July 1st, 2024. So certainly within three months, our law would take effect prior to that. And then the county law would take precedent over the state law in that case. So if if the understanding is that the county law will take precedent, why is planning department? It, sorry. It, so <laughs> it's because they, basically the way it's written, even though the effective date is 2024, it's not clear on the way it's written on whether the, um, the, the priority would be given to laws that are currently in effect, like Anne Arundel's laws are currently in effect, or and ours we would hope to be, or whether it would be at the time of 2024 if those ones you would need to have the alternative approach approved prior to July of 2024 anyways, and it's a matter of priority of how they're going to review them and say it's okay. Ms. Wallace. Right. So, I mean, it sounds like it's kind of like us reserving our place in line to get reviewed by the state DNR. Um, so I don't think we're going to be able to give a precise legal answer. I think it's, you know, kind of trying to get us a little head in the queue or being comfortable with the fact that we might not be first in line. Understood. Uh, Council Vice President Friesen. Yeah, well, thanks for the clarification. I, I will say I wish this was raised much earlier because we could have just asked that this be clarified in the state bill and I think it was a missed opportunity and so that's a little disappointing to be honest. But um, what happens, Council uh, Member, Alvarez was raising the issue of those who are w in development review. And so are we changing, if we, if we expedite this, is there a concern that we'd be changing the standards in the middle of the game, or would they be held to the rules when they submitted site plan, for instance, 
and it would only be for new applications. Could you clarify that, please? We could have something that's a, that says it is basically if something has been submitted and accepted already, then it's under the current law as it is instead of the expedited. Well, at the very least, I think that we need to have, I mean, we can't change the rules in the middle of the game. I don't think that's fair for, for anybody. I, I'm not sure exactly the dynamics here vis-a-vis -vis the, the state law. It sounds like it's not clear. I, I wish we had clarified that much earlier in the session. We might be late in the game. We're scheduled to vote on this today. Uh, but I think at the very least, we should include transition language that would allow for submitted plans to be honored, uh, but new plans to be subject to, uh, to, to, to the new bill. And, I, and, I, and I'm very supportive of this new bill and very appreciative of it and look forward to passing it and feel very strongly about it. But I think this you know, transition, we just have to make sure that we're you know, reserving the right of the county at the state level and also uh, being fair to those who are part of the process. Ms. Wallens, uh, is, is thank that, you, Mr. President. can that be achieved? Yes, um, on page seven of the staff memorandum, we do have for your consideration a transition clause to try to achieve some clarity for folks who are in the pipeline. Um, and this was an issue that T&E committee did discuss and particularly council member Balcom, um, but you didn't have the language in front of you at the time. And this language that's on page seven essentially just mirrors the transition language that we've used for prior uh, for the our original, you know, forest conservation law in the county, in addition to um, subsequent amendments to those laws, we've had this translate, excuse me, transition language in there. So the suggestion, the staff suggestion, would be to include it here as well. Very good. There it, we are entertaining a motion to exped, uh, an amendment to expedite the bill. That's currently what's before us. Uh, Council Member Lutie. So a couple of things, um, and and thank you for adding the transition clause because that's very important. So just to make sure everybody's on the same decision-making page. Both the Senate bill and the House bill never moved out of committee. And crossover day was yesterday. So it's not too late to raise your concerns, but they haven't made it out of committee. So they're now in, you know, kind of a legislative purgatory, if you will, over these next three weeks and probably not likely to move. Um, so this is something that to the extent that everyone still has ongoing concerns about the procedure can be dealt with in the off season so that when the bill inevitably comes back next year, it can have the language that you all believe will help clarify that. So I just wanted to make that point clear. Thank you. Appreciate the update from Annapolis. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's important. That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Um, anybody else? Councilmember Stewart, did you want to? No, I, I was going to make the point Ms. Wellens made about the transition language, so I'm good. Oh, hold on, colleagues. Councilmember Albernos. Thanks. So I appreciate the clause. So then would we need to um, have a friendly amendment to the amendment proposed to include the clause, or would it need to be a separate amendment? Separate. A separate okay. amendment. Got it. Okay. Council Vice President. Yeah. I, is there an indication that there would be support for that? Because I wouldn't support expediting the bill unless there was a transition clause. I, I do think mm -hmm. that there related, but if we're going right. to do both of them, I'd be very right. comfortable with yeah. that. Okay. okay. So happy to support both. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Not seeing any other comments. So there is a motion to exp an amendment to expedite this legislation. All those in favor of that amendment? That is unanimous. Okay. No, 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 no I'm sorry. Unanimous. Oh, I'm sorry. I, di I, I didn't see you right in my line. Uh, all those opposed to the amendment? Councilmember Balcom opposes. Thank you. Uh, okay, Council Vice President Friesen. I'd like to move the transition language as proposed by Council staff. Second. Okay, that is uh, that amendment to the transition language has been moved by Council Vice President Friesen, seconded by Council Member Ludke. Council Member Friesen, wanna... as noted, I think it's important that those who have already applied are not having rules being changed in the middle of the game. Council Member so, Balcom. So the, the amendment is that the plan be approved, not applied. So there's, this I, is that, that if the plan was approved, so there are people who, for instance, are in the process of getting that plan approved. If we expedite it and it's signed tomorrow, then you could be on the docket to get approved on Friday and you have to start all over again. So 
I can. Yeah. I would actually recommend that it's instead of approved that it's a that it was submitted. submitted. Yes. Uh, I will accept as a friendly amendment that the yes. seconder also yes. will. That was That's my lovely. intention. Thank you. I appreciate you catching that. So thank you. Friendly Thanks. amendment accepted. <laughs> Any other comments? Uh, seeing those, those in favor of the amendment, saying five arrows in your hand, and that is unanimous. Very good. Uh, any other comments? Um, so uh, I will just add in closing, very good conversation, lots of moving parts, and uh, appreciate again the update uh, from, from Annapolis. And the, the reality also is that moving forward, what this bill does and signals is that as we continue to grow, and develop our community. Uh, we will find places for trees, but as we continue to grow, let's also make sure that we grow in places where they uh, can accommodate the growth without making these decisions, namely infill development, transit-oriented development. There are a lot of areas where we can continue to grow that does not jeopardize trees. And I think that is an, uh, a secondary message with this legislation. Um, so with that, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? We need a motion, Mr. Oh. President. Oh, because it's been amended. You're right. Correct. Is there a motion? I'd like to so move. Uh, a motion by Council Member Sale, seconded by Council Member Balcom. Council Member Lukey? Yes. Council Member Lukey votes yes. Council Member Mink? Yes. Council Member Mink votes yes. Council Member Sales? Yes. Council Member Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Dewando? Uh, yes. Councilmember Dewando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Forest Conservation Bill passes. Thank you all very much. <laughs> excitement from the dais. We got a lot more bills to work on, so hold on to that excitement. Uh, next second bill that we will take up is Bill 2822, Common Ownership Communities, Duties, Requirements, and Procedures. A Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee recommends enactment with amendments. I'll turn it over to the Chair of the PHP Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, appreciate it. We uh, had a robust discussion in committee. We both talked about the bill and the broader uh, operational dynamics uh, of uh, the department uh, and the Common Ownership uh, Communities Commission, uh, and we plan to have some council uh, committee work sessions uh, and discussions about that. There have been some staffing changes, and we're going to continue to uh, to work on that. But uh, this was uh, a bill that uh, came forward from the executive that was introduced in the last council that we uh, took up. Uh, the uh, uh, key decision points uh, were to amend the bill in order to make a technical correction uh, on the section numbering referring to the training requirement for commissioners of the uh, uh, common ownership communities, uh, amend the bill uh, which was a request from uh, DHCA in order to enable uh, the commission to enforce a breach of a mediation agreement uh, and uh, make that a class A uh, violation and then to uh, uh, otherwise uh, enact uh, the bill uh, as amended. I will uh, turn to uh, council staff if there's anything uh, to add uh, on the bill, but uh, the committee uh, voted unanimously uh, on the amendments and voted 3 nothing to move this uh, out of uh, committee for consideration of the full council. Uh, good morning, Council President and the Council Members, and thank you for that uh, introduction uh, from Council Member Fritzen. Uh, I have nothing to add I, except just to mention that we do have Mr. Espin from DHCA as well as Ms. Fabio if there were any questions, but as stated, the um, recommendation from the committee was unanimous, and I have nothing further to add. Thank you, Ms. Coney, and uh, with that, we have a committee recommendation that's uh, before the body for a vote. Okay. Not seeing any other uh, council member Ludke. Oh no, I was just going to move to approve. There we go. Well, we don't need to. We don't need amendment. to move. It's been approved by by the committee without amendment. So, Madam Clerk, 
Well, you call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Councilmember okay. Sales. Oh, hold on. Hold, hold on, please. Okay. Councilmember Sales. Thank you. Um, I just had a question about the, um, I don't know if anyone from the CCOC is here to answer. Oh, good. Uh, back here, if someone from CCOC can come on down. If you'd like to introduce yourselves, uh, yes, good right, turn on your mic. Yes, good morning, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Ramon Espin. I'm the new uh, COC uh, manager together here with. Good morning, council members. My name is Ife Fabayo, and I'm one of the investigators. Thank you. Um, I know that the CCOC has taken on a lot more properties under their oversight. And I don't know if anyone can give us a brief update on the work plan since you've grown going forward and how you're evaluating. Sure, I'll be happy to answer that. So uh, the CCOC, uh, effective July 1st of 2022, took over uh, community associations within the city of Gaithersburg. I don't have the count in front of you today. Uh, as part of that, the division has hired a new investigator. Okay. Um, uh, he's actually come on board uh, 30 days ago. The division has also hired a permanent uh, manager uh, for this position here, which I have taken over here. So uh, that alone uh, just brings additional resources okay. to the division, uh, and the commission uh, is very happy to hear about the, uh, some of the changes in, the, uh, in, our, in our office there. <clears throat> okay. And have you uh, changed your um, uh, criteria or process for resolving complaints or made any? Well, Council Member Sales, uh, the committee is going to have a work session uh, on uh, with the CCOC to further okay. to, to go in further detail about their work and the operation. So um, excellent questions, if you don't mind holding them. Yes, okay. I can hold my questions. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any other questions, Madam Clerk, you can call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Abernos? Yes. Councilmember Abernos votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, the next bill for final reading is Bill 323, Environmental Sustainability, Montgomery County uh, Green Bank. Uh, the t &E committee recommends enactment with amendments. This is a really exciting piece of legislation that we are about to vote on at, that would allow the Montgomery County Green Bank to engage in activities related to climate resilience uh, in the same manner in which it undertakes energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, we have a very unique uh, green bank here uh, which is a national leader in its efforts to work with the private sector to uh, enhance our infrastructure, uh, and this will further allow them to do even more work. Um, the t and &E committee unanimously recommended uh, enactment of the bill with, with a few amendments that I think are, are important for this conversation. Uh, we agreed to increase the maximum number of board members from 11 to 15, which is a recognition of the work that the Green Bank was doing, and as we uh, increase their uh, capability with the passage of this law, they too want to increase their capacity to do that work by having a, uh, even more uh, advisors. Uh, we required the Green Bank Board uh, to meet with the T&E Committee more regularly to discuss the work that they are undertaking. Um, and for those who uh, were here last session, um, we had a very robust debate as we expanded the Green Bank by uh, providing 
more revenue to them. Uh, when we provided more revenue to them, we restricted the use of that revenue to make sure that it was for clean, uh, clean energy technology. Um, and uh, we're doing the same thing uh, in this regard as well. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to Kandakele for any additional thoughts. Uh, thank you very much, Council President. Um, uh, like you rightly pointed out all the um, amendments were reviewed and unanimously recommended by the committee i did just want to flag at page four of the um the one additional amendment that was approved by the committee was that there is a provision in the legislation in section 18a-49 this is outlined at page four of the staff memo where the board of the green bank must meet it used to be semi-annually and that, now that's changing to an annual meeting with the it was proposed by the executive that this meeting be with the council president, and the TNE committee specifically felt that this is something that should be, it's an annual meeting that should occur with the, they said the TNE committee, but I um, advise that the names of committees could change from time to time, and you don't want to bill every time the name of the committee changes. So the wording should be that the annual meeting between the board should be with the executive and the committee charged with overseeing matters related to environmental sustainability. That, uh, that amendment was unanimously uh, adopted by the committee as well. Thank you for that. Uh, Council Vice President Friedson. Yeah, first of all, thank you to the Transportation and Environment Committee. Really appreciate your work on this bill. Thank you to the county executive and uh, to the Green Bank. Uh, this is a really exciting bill it provides a lot more opportunities for us to take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act and some of the resiliency funding that is available in the Inflation Reduction Act it allows for us to take advantage of some state programs that are going to be moving forward and allows us to really leverage the strength of the Green Bank I think that this uh, is exciting and I'm very glad that it's going to be additive you know, I worked very hard with Councilmember Hucker in the last session to uh, secure the 10% of the fuel energy tax to support the Green Bank's activities to green retrofit buildings uh, and residences to make sure that we are helping our residents meet our ambitious goals. We talk a lot about those strong environmental goals, but we need to provide the ladders to help residents and businesses actually uh, reach it. And the committee's recognition that we didn't want uh, those funds to be taken away from their intention and move towards resiliency projects. We wanted to add resiliency uh, projects, I think is really helpful and really important. I'm very grateful and appreciative uh, of that. Uh, there's also been a longstanding request from the Green Bank uh, because of the increase in their responsibilities and their funds to expand the board uh, outside of this particular bill, but I'm glad that it was incorporated as part of this bill. There was discussion of whether or not there'd be a need for a separate bill, and so I'm glad that that was included as well. So thank you. Uh, to the Transportation Environment Committee for buttoning everything up and putting it into uh, one uh, bill here. Uh, there's tremendous opportunity uh, for us to really focus on resiliency, to look at things like microloans and other aspects that, that there is uh, a significant opportunity with leveraging federal and state funds and private sector dollars. The Green Bank is uniquely positioned to do that, uh, and the work of the committee and us approving this bill uh, today will allow us to move that forward. So thank you to colleagues. Really looking forward to approving this bill and making sure that we uh, continue the Green Bank's work. The last thing that I'll say, uh, Council President Glass mentioned the electrification uh, amendments that were very important to the bill uh, originally for the fuel energy tax. There was also an amendment that was moved forward by Councilmember Navarro that was supported by all colleagues. Uh, that uh, focused a portion of the funds to make sure that they were being utilized in equity emphasis areas. And I think it's important to note every time that we talk about this that those goals have been exceeded, uh, overwhelmingly exceeded. Actually, six months through the year, uh, the, the target was hit for the entire year. So it's nearly doubling uh, the target amount, which I think is a really important point and demonstrates the, the need, the connection between environmental justice and social justice. And so I just want to make sure I I acknowledge that, thank the, the Green Bank for the fidelity with which they followed through on that effort, and thank colleagues for your work on this bill. Look forward to approving it. Uh, thank you for, for adding that equity emphasis. emphasis, uh, And uh, that was actually just brought to uh, discussion at the Council of Government, so we shared, we shared that good news with the entire region, so thank you. Uh, Council Member Sales. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just had a question briefly about this uh, bill, about this um, change to the Green Bank and the additional responsibilities. Um, I noticed that this authority can acquire property by means other than eminent domain, regulate resilience infrastructure owned by authorizing entity, receive money, charge, and collect fees for service. Um, where would this money go? I actually, uh, we, we have both the CEO and this uh, chief investment officer from the Green Bank, if, you know, maybe they can give more specifics. Thank you. Can if, I see Mr. Dale? No. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, Do we have anybody? Oh, I, okay. Mr. Edwards? Yes, Mr. Stan Edwards is here as yep. well. Oh, I, I, I guess um, someone's here. Not. Oh, apparently there was a miscommunication, so the Green Bank people are not here, but they were, okay. they were present for the committee discussion. An ex officio oh. member of the board, I believe. Uh, special advisor to the special board. advisor there. Stan Edwards with the Department of Environmental Protection. I think the uh, council member. Sir? Stan Edwards. Stan Adams, yes. thank you. Um, I think the, um, I'm with the Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection, but I've thank been involved you. with the Green Bank since its okay. inception. Um, I think the language you're reading was from the Resilience Authority legislation. Yes, yes we are not adopting that language. Uh, we are just making the Green Bank, in, enabling the Green Bank to do resilience activities. So those provisions you listed there are not uh, part of the charter of the Green Bank in Montgomery County. No, not the Green Bank, but we're adding new members to comply with the state mandate to create a resilience authority. No, we're adding members to the Green Bank because the Board of Directors, which is a uh, very integral part of what the Green Bank does, these are unpaid uh, yeah, board volunteers. members. Um, mm -hmm. They sit on a lot of committees and advise the Green Bank, and so the capacity of the Green Bank, particularly if we have resilience activities, is being stretched thin, so adding additional members to the board will enable them to, to get additional expertise. Uh, that's not uh, in, in any way to fulfill a state requirement. We are not pursuing designation of the Green Bank as a resilience authority at this time. We're just in, in, increasing their capability under the county's local law. Okay, so they won't be doing any of the resilience authority activities that they won't be acquiring okay. property and some of the other things you mentioned, right? They'll be, they could be engaged in resilience related activities, but in the same way that they're engaged in energy efficiency and clean energy activities now. So, okay. thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Councilmember Balcom. Um, thank you. Uh, I love the Green Bank, very supportive of, it, of its mission, and uh, just want to, uh, I, I think it's so important to help uh, people really invest in in critical environmental pr uh, programs and investments and so uh, appreciate that and I think that this is a great addition and I look forward to seeing what the Green Bank can do and, and I fully support this bill thank you thank you the future is green thank you Ms. Oconee for your work on this uh, not seeing any other comments uh, Ms. Uh, Madam Clerk will you call the roll Council Member Lukey? yes Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernos? Yes. Councilmember Albernos votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, expedited bill 523, personnel and human resources, prospective employees, health care, privacy. A government operations committee recommends enactment with amendments. Turn it over to the chair of the GO committee. Thank you. Um, this bill, the lead sponsor is Council Member Lukey, and I will say that every other council member is a co-sponsor. <laughs> so hopefully this will go smoothly this morning. Uh, what would this bill do? It would limit inquiries by the county regarding certain health information of prospective employees. Second, prohibit inquiries by the county regarding certain, certain reproductive health information of prospective employees. Third, limit consideration by the county of certain health information of prospective employees. 
fourth, permit certain appeals to the Merit System Protection Board, and finally, generally amend the laws regarding human resources and health care privacy. The GO Committee unanimously recommends the enactment of the bill with amendments, um, and these were amendments that the lead sponsor agreed to as well. Um, the amendments are to define the term contractual position in order to clarify that medical forms are not required of individuals who enter into small procurements to provide services for the county. The second was to alter the bill's effective date so that instead of being expedited, the bill will take effect 120 days after it becomes law. And finally, clarify that the county is entitled to request and consider business-related health care information solely to determine whether an applicant meets a minimum job qualification. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Lukey uh, for bringing this issue forward. As many of us began to set up our offices um, in December, we realized the problems with this form, and I just want to thank her for taking the lead on this. I also want to thank the Office of Human Resources. We do have a new director there, and she has informed the committee they are already working on these issues, and I just want to thank them for their, um, their work on this. Um, and with the uh, Council President's permission, I'll turn it over to Council Member Lukey for comments. Council Member Lukey. Thank you. I, I just want to thank you all for, for joining me in this effort, as well as thanking uh, Christine Mullins for, for her invaluable assistance in, in getting this together and our housekeeping amendments in the, in the GO Committee. Uh, and the county executive uh, for his support. And uh, definitely want to give a shout out to our new OHR director, Tracy Anderson, and her entire team for their collegiality and cooperation on working through this. And, um, you know, she is new to that role and, uh, and she's dove in head first. And I truly appreciate uh, that ongoing partnership. And uh, this will go a great distance to removing a process that currently is intrusive and unnecessary and kind of runs counter to our values of inclusivity and accessibility and could prevent us from hiring uh, the best candidates for different roles for unnecessary reasons and um, just isn't the way we should be welcoming employees who end up going through the interview process and are recommended for selection for employment. So I um, look forward to this uh, go coming into effect. And I also want to thank our labor partners at McGeo for their support. Um, and I look forward to lots of follow-up conversations with everyone throughout the implementation phase of this bill. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Uh, also want to express thanks to Councilmember Lukey and, and to all colleagues for sponsoring this, but thank you for taking the lead. This is something that has been festering for years and uh, was, I think, when the four new of us started a few years ago, there were questions raised, but it, it, I'm glad you took the, the initiative and addressed it. Um, and uh, appreciate uh, Ms. Wellens and the uh, county executive staff. Uh, I do want to say that I'm hoping, and I, I agree with uh, Ms. Ms. Anderson's new leadership, I'm hoping we can do a comprehensive review, uh, which I understand they are, of, mm -hmm. because I know this isn't the only thing that's a relic of some far gone past that should not be in our uh, HR regulations and probably is in some ways impeding getting good talent uh, and or violating people's personal information. So uh, we have the Chief Administrative Officer in the, in the room and, and he's hearing this. and. So I, I just hope that as part of that review, you will come back to us proactively and take steps because we obviously not really functional to pass legislation every time. Um, this is an, um, one that we really needed to because it needed to change. Uh, to continue our work to try to be a model employer. Um, I did have one question for Ms. Wellens. Uh, does this uh, preserve the county's ability to ask for vaccination status uh, if it's deemed critical for public health? And f for example, is uh, could that be considered a minimum qualification under the bill? It, I mean, it could. The bill doesn't prevent that. I mean, I think that would be, you know, a separate analysis of whether the county uh, wants that information in order to, you know, whether it's set as a minimum qualification. And, and if it is, then under the bill would allow the county, entitle the county to ask for that information. Yeah. So, yes. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's the <a> short <laughs> answer. Thank Sorry. you very much. Um, Thank you, Mr. President. Look forward to supporting this. Thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you. I really do appreciate everyone's leadership on this, and I hope this serves as a model for our nonprofit private sectors as well, um, just as a message to them too, because of what we are seeing and the 
radical changes that are happening before us in the Supreme Court, it's now more important than ever um, for us to hold the line at a local level and being a welcoming community in every way imaginable. Um, and so I'm very appreciative that this was put forward, and I'm also appreciative that OHR acted so quickly, and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I really want to thank you, Councilmember Lukey, for acknowledging that, because sometimes the wheels of bureaucracy can be slow to change, uh, but in this case they were clearly not, um, and so this is this is a good day. Thank you. Uh, I also just want to extend my appreciation to Councilmember Ludke for uh, this first bill of hers. Uh, my first piece of legislation four years ago was uh, updating the the hiring process to work on closing the wage gap that exists. Uh, and I'm working with the executive team right now to get a comprehensive report to see uh, how we move the needle on that. So uh, to Councilmember Jawando's point, there's lots of conversations that we need to continue having. Uh, part of our oversight responsibilities, uh, but this this piece of legislation uh, will help move us uh, in that direction and provide health equity and health fairness for all of our 10,000 hardworking county employees. Not seeing any other comments, Madam Clerk, if you can call the roll. Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernos? Yes. Councilmember Albernos votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. Okay. That passed unanimously. Congratulations, Councilmember Lukey. <laughs> Your first bill. Uh, well, yes, we're 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 going on a, a, another lewd key bill. Um, next bill that we will be taking up is Bill 823, Boards, Committees, and Commissions Open Meetings Supplemental Requirements. A Government Operations Committee recommends enactment with amendments. I'll turn it over to the Chair of the GO Committee. Great, thank you. Um, so again, this is Councilmember Lukey's bill, um, co-sponsors Councilmember Katz and Council President Glass. Um, as originally introduced, this bill would require boards, committees, and commissions to publish with certain time frames the dates, times, and locations of meetings, meeting agenda, and meeting minutes. It would require boards, committees, and commissions to make meeting recordings available under certain circumstances. It would require the posting of draft meeting minutes under certain circumstances. It would also require certain reporting by the Office of the County Executive to the Council and finally generally amend the laws regarding boards, committees, and commissions and regarding open meetings. Um, the GO Committee did unanimously um, support enactment of this bill with amendments. Um, again, the sponsor agreed with the amendments. The first was to remove the bill's requirement to post draft minutes. Um, the second was to provide for the posting of agenda as soon as practical if a meeting is held in response to a declared amendment. And finally, to provide the executive the flexibility to designate which office within the executive branch would receive complaints and submit reports under the bill. Um, and there were certain technical corrections also made. Um, but again, the GO Committee um, recommends this bill for enactment. And I'll turn it back to the Council President. Uh, thank you. I'll turn it over to the bill sponsor, Councilmember Ludke. Thank you. Again, I appreciate my colleagues and the GO Committee for their support of this legislation, as well as Ken Hartman from the County Executive's Office for his help and discussion and collegiality on this piece of legislation. Um, it's important to emphasize that timely and consistent posting of agendas and meeting links, meeting locations and recordings if a meeting was recorded is for the benefit not just of the public but also for the committee members volunteering their time. Um, and I think there's a genuine recognition from the county executive branch that we've got to do a better job than we've been doing and how do we make it easier for the public to find things that we are uh, posting so that folks can keep on, on top of the different uh, advice that our boards and committees and commissions are giving to us, the council and the county executive. Um, this legislation as amended puts us on a far better path and I'm committed to continuing that work with Mr. Hartman, our GO committee, and the entire council and executive branch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. uh, not seeing any other comments, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? 
Councilmember Lukey? Yes. Councilmember Lukey votes yes. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernos? Yes. Councilmember Albernos votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Councilmember Glass? Yes. Councilmember Glass votes yes. And that is unanimous. <laughs> Two for Tuesday. Um, <laughs> Next piece of legislation we are taking up is expedited Bill 423, Administration, Non-Merit Positions, Special Projects Manager. The GO Committee recommends enactment with amendments. All right, the GO Committee was busy uh, the last few weeks. Um, so this bill would create a second non-merit special projects manager position in the office of the county executive. Um, the Office of the County Executive currently has one Special Projects Manager and this bill would increase that number to two. The Special Project Manager is a senior level position responsible for planning, developing, coordinating, and implementing projects within the Office of the Chief Administrative Officer. The County Executive has stated that one major initiative for this new position would be to help bridge the digital divide by coordinating efforts to extend the physical infrastructure needed for better access to high-speed um, broadband and there was a description of that in the packet and um, the chief administrator officer who is here did provide testimony to the council um, regarding this position and what it would be focusing on. The GO committee does recommend approval of um, this bill uh, with an amendment. Um, it was an amendment I proposed which was to include a sunset date that this act must expire and must have no further force of or effect after um, three years from the effective date. Um, the reason I had proposed this and the GO Committee accepted it is that uh, we agreed with the importance of this position to look at the digital divide, but given the opportunities are imminent at this moment, we thought it prudent that um, the County Exec's Office comes back in three years um, to tell us whether or not this position needs to continue or if it can be sunsetted. Um, so that is what the GO Committee recommends. Thank you. Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez. This one I had to think a lot. And um, especially when I read the report and I saw the, you know, all the different people that the county executive has as a special assistance, and this will be one more. Um, so they get into it even more. And um, I realized that especially in the Economic Development Committee where I chair. Um, I work closely with uh, one of such as assistants, like Jake is one of them that I'm constantly working with. Uh, I have also had the pleasure of working with other members of the team from the county executive, like Debbie on environmental issues and uh, Dale on, you know, tenants protection and so on and so forth. And uh, when we think about technology and digital divide, I had a hard time thinking, well, who will be my go-to person to work on this? Who will be the person who will be working towards assisting the county and the county council to move us forward on closing that digital divide? Um, I had, um, so I, you know, call some folks, and um, the answer was that there is actually a lack of efforts in this area and and there is a need of ensuring that um, that the federal government the state government is is um, that we're taking advantage of, of opportunities that they're offering in terms of grants to ensure that um, the digital divide is, is closed in the county uh, so based on that I I'm gonna vote yes on this and I look forward to having whoever gets on this position because at the end of the day it is the county executive who appoints um, the person who will fill this position. I look forward to working with that person uh, in front of the Economic um, Development Committee uh, on anything related to technology to ensure that uh, we're really moving forward as a county and um, 
So I feel that I had to share that. Um, again, it took me a while to get to this decision, and I, I think it's the right one based on the things that I just shared. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Albernoz. Thank you. I appreciate those comments by Councilmember Flanagan Gonzalez. And I really do want to express my appreciation to the executive branch for putting this forward. Uh, for those, uh, everybody knows, I worked in the executive branch for 12 years prior to this position that I'm in now, and I know how it works internally with what is often referred to as the second floor, uh, connecting dots among different departments and agencies. And as was stated, uh, the broadband issue is a critical one uh, to unlock a number of key priorities. And just in the space of health and human services, we are trying to aggressively pursue telehealth and telemedicine opportunities for our community which will significantly contribute to our overall public health. But that is all predicated on people having access to the technology and knowing how to use that technology here in our community. And I feel that the time is right for us to aggressively pursue opportunities at both the federal and the state level uh, to create true and meaningful public-private partnerships that will benefit us for generations. And this is all moving very quickly, uh, and this is a global issue. And so I credit the administration for putting this position forward. I look forward to supporting it, and whomever is appointed to that position, I know will work closely with the council to advance the policies that we want to advance moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thanks to, to colleagues. This was a tough one for me, too. Uh, we talked about it quite a bit in, in committee. Uh, I don't think I would have supported this without the amendment to sunset it uh, after three years, so I really did want to uh, thank the, the GEO Chair for, for putting that forward. Uh, one of the rationales uh, that was given for this position is the unique point in time that we have with federal money that is available related uh, to uh, the digital divide and significant resources uh, that we want to have a point person to do that. Uh, on the one hand, I do give deference and respect the executive's prerogative to be able to set up a government uh, that the executive believes will fulfill the needs of the community, and I think that's important. On the other hand, I think this position should have been added during the budget process. I think we should have found vacancies. I made that very clear uh, during committee. Uh, I said during committee uh, very clearly that uh, in the, this upcoming budget we need to be looking at vacancies and I hope that the executive would be looking uh, at vacancies. The budget has now come out and that was clearly not the case. There's 137 new positions uh, in the county government, not including the increases uh, to schools. Uh, which is very disappointing. Uh, by all accounts, we're still waiting for final numbers. There's about 1,500 vacancies across county government, uh, which uh, is also uh, disappointing. Uh, there was a restructuring of government work group that was set up where we paid money to a consultant, uh, and it only identified nine vacancies to potentially eliminate. Few, if any, of those have actually been eliminated, and so we've seen virtually no savings at a cost to taxpayers. Uh, which is uh, disappointing. So uh, I'm going to approve this. I'm going to stand by the decision that I made uh, at committee, uh, but uh, will reiterate the concerns that I have about the fact that uh, this was not uh, done at the time that I think it should have appropriately been done, uh, and that uh, the work needed to restructure government, which is the other half of the prerogative that an executive has to have a government that is established to meet the needs of the community that requires following through on the restructuring commitments that have been made for the past five years. Uh, and I think that work is going to have to happen during the budget process, and I think that the council is going to have to take on uh, that work to do the type of uh, thinking and prioritizing and reorganizing and restructuring uh, that unfortunately didn't occur uh, with the budget that came over. But with that, I'll be approving this position. Uh, and look forward to the very difficult and challenging decisions that we're now going to have to make during the budget process. Thank you. Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, colleagues, I respectfully cannot support the bill at this time. Um, and I appreciate the effort that the GO Committee made in trying to amend the bill, but that's still approximately $650,000 dollars of taxpayer money to pay for something that I'm not convinced that the roles described for this position 
couldn't be done with existing um, people and resources we have. Um, and when I hear my colleagues talking about identifying access gaps, and connecting people, and grant writing, and intergovernmental relations, this position won't actually do those things and is not a grant writer. And we already have an intergovernmental relations team that works for the county executive and for the council. Um, and so I really feel like this could have been accomplished through streamlining of programmatic goals for the existing employees that we have in order to focus on the objectives that are currently before us and the opportunities presented both by the state and federal governments for um, additional funding in those areas. And I certainly respect the county executive's prerogative to structure his office and his staff the way he chooses, but I'm also incredibly mindful, as Council Vice President Friedson just mentioned, of the overwhelming amount of vacancies, vacancies that we have. Um, and again, and previously when we were discussing the need to look at jobs and job classifications and, and figure out um, some good housekeeping there. And our county government has grown significantly in size recently and is proposed to grow more next fiscal year um, at, again, an additional proposed cost on our taxpayers and residents. So um, with that, Council President, I, res um, you know, I certainly appreciate the mission, um, but that given our current county fiscal situation, I don't think this is the, the appropriate way to achieve uh, that mission and in exercising our fiscal oversight. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Ludke. I appreciate the thoughtfulness of your comments. Uh, I also appreciate the work that the Government Operations Committee did. Uh, the, the the many conversations that took place uh, to determine the uh, efficiency or even efficacy of, of this position. Um, I have been thinking about this position myself and at this point, I cannot support the creation of this position. We have the Department of Technology and Enterprise Business Solutions that does this work. There are dozens and dozens of individuals who work to uh, advance our technological and broadband capacity throughout the county. Can we do more? Should we do more? Absolutely. But we also have 1,500 vacancies in county government. And in the FY24 budget that was pr provided to us last week by the county executive, there are 137 new tax-supported positions. And if this position is approved today by this passage of this legislation, that's one more. Um, I, four years ago, told the county executive I would be a willing partner in working to streamline and overhaul county government to do right by our hard-working employees and to do right by our hard-paying taxpayers. Um, and I don't think that this legislation and the creation of this position moves us toward that common goal. And so I will not be supporting it. Councilmember Mink. Thank you to all of my colleagues for those thoughtful comments and to the GO Committee for your, for your work on this. Um, I had some of the same questions as some of my colleagues. Um, I also think that this mission is extremely important. Um, I see that we have some folks from the county executive's office. Um, with the president's permission, would it be all right to have them? Uh, Mr. Madalena would like to come on down. Thank you. I wondered if, if you might like to speak about some of the thoughts that you've just heard, which is also something that I have been wrestling with as Mr. well. Mr. Hartman, you can join us too. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, um, Councilmember Meek, for the questions. Um, you know, I don't, um, as many of you know, I'm used to being in a legislative session debating a bill, so I'll try not to do that and answer the questions. But um, what the, if you look at some of the issues around the digital divide that we think this position is um, very well positioned to work on and that our TEB staff have said that they are they do not have the capacity or the level of experience or connection to do um, interaction, at the, interaction at the state level. And in fact, working with the incredible opportunity that we have with the Moore administration um, and um, his team to make sure that we are fully utilizing the, um, the opportunities that the state has through its own funding and through the 
enormous amount of aid that came to the state for broadband so having those connections and doing that work at the state level where our department of technology and enterprise solutions is not doing that type of work and yes we have an office of intergovernmental relations but they aren't necessarily working on these sorts of programmatic issues on a day in and day out basis working with our corporate partners and really doing corporate philanthropy and trying to make sure we are smart at going out and getting resources to work on these issues that we would not otherwise have access to and is not necessarily the day-to-day -day role of someone within TEBS or another county agency to be going out there and doing that sort of work. That is something that um, higher level employees, especially in the county executive's office, um, should do as well as, and I think you heard Council Member Alberno speak a little to, to this, interagency coordination um, to make sure not just within county, within the Montgomery County government, but our, our agency partners at MCPS, at the County Public Schools and Montgomery College, where we have a lot of different opportunities to interact with them on broadband and trying to make sure on closing the digital divide, and, and it's broader than just broadband, but um, you probably all have interacted, and I'm sure you, Councilmember Mink, with children in the school system, have interacted with devices like me coming home that, that um, the students are supposed to use and then go back to the school um, uh, before um, the school year ends. I mean, there are a bunch of different things going on to try to sync up the various investments we have between the, count, uh, between the county government, the school system, the college, what we have access to at the state and federal levels. And so that's why we think this is a unique opportunity at this moment with so much federal funds on the table um, from, from the Biden administration, so much um, interest in working on this issue at the state level with, uh, with a new administration and a strong new team on the second floor um, and for their second floor as opposed to our second floor and um, the opportunity we have with this council and this administration to really make progress at this time. Hopefully I answered your question as I came Thank up. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you, Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I too am gonna to vote for this legislation. Um, I, I've said many times, not just on this topic, but on any other, many other topics, that if you want someone to be able to do a job, then you have to give them the tools to do it. And in this case, tools are also people, oh, by the way. And this allows, I mean, let's, let's uh, talk about what this allows for. This allows for one, one additional non-merit uh, uh, special projects manager in the county executive's office. So therefore, this would allow for the county executive to be able to do a job that we have been talking about is needed for many, many years. I, I, you know, I'm not going to go back into history very much, but what I am going to say is that years ago, I, I visited uh, Emory Grove, which was not in Gaithersburg. I was associated with Gaithersburg at that time, but it was right next. And, and uh, Comcast, I believe, had, had set up a new program, and it was new in those days, so we're going back away, that, that, uh, that people who could not afford computers or, or uh, broadband or whatever, that they, they brought it to, to this community. And, and not, I don't know, several weeks ago, I was in a business, and a, a, a person asked me if I recognized her, and I didn't, and she said that I was there when her child's life was changed because this program had started. Her child at that point could do his homework, and at that point, that child has, has prospered. You know, if, if this program goes anywhere near doing what that program did, we've made a very, very good investment for a very small price and we're getting federal money besides. So I, I believe that this is the right thing to do. I believe it's the right time to do it. I believe that, and I'm on the Government Operations Committee, I believe that the sunset makes sense so that we'll make certain that it gives the uh, time to make certain that this will work. But this is, 
this is the right legislation at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Not seeing any other comments. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Councilmember Ludke? No. Councilmember Ludke votes no. Councilmember Mink? Yes. Councilmember Mink votes yes. Councilmember Sales? Yes. Councilmember Sales votes yes. Councilmember Albernaz? Yes. Councilmember Albernaz votes yes. Councilmember Jawando? Yes. Councilmember Jawando votes yes. Councilmember Katz? Yes. Councilmember Katz votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Councilmember Glass? No. Councilmember Glass votes no. And that passes nine to two. Thank you very much. Uh, the last bill for final reading uh, this morning is Bill 1822, uh, Noise Control Leaf Removal Equipment Amendments. The T&E Committee recommends enactment with amendments. And uh, this is otherwise known as the leaf blower ban, the gas leaf blower ban bill. Um, which was introduced last year, um, and a public hearing was held last year, but there was no further action taken uh, until the start of this session. Um, we had a T&E committee work session back in February, uh, uh, public hearing in, in February, and then a work session uh, as well, two, two work sessions, uh, I'm sorry. We had a T&E committee work session on, in February and then a very full council work session. I'm trying to get my, my dates straight there, March 7th. Um, th the reality is uh, the county executive introduced this uh, piece of legislation for our consideration, recognizing that the toll that gas-powered leaf blowers has on our communities uh, affects a lot of different people. It uh, affects the individuals who are using the equipment. It affects individuals in their homes while that equipment is being used. Um, it has environmental impacts and it has health impacts. And as other jurisdictions around the region are adopting similar measures, uh, and some municipalities within Montgomery County have already adopted similar measures. Uh, the time has come for Montgomery County as a whole to take a similar position. Uh, and the T&E committee uh, added a number of amendments to the bill requiring a method two regulation uh, for the purpose of the grant money that would be used so that uh, individuals or businesses who have to convert their gas-powered leaf blower into an electric would be compensated or receive some stipend for, for that to make the transition more financially uh, easier. Uh, and a method two regulation would allow the council to check in on that process. Uh, there were record, re reporting requirements that were added um, and that we also exempted agricultural producers. Uh, recognizing that uh, their workload is is nothing like that of a, a single-family homeowner um, or those working on, on single-family properties. Um, uh, with that, Ms. McCartney Green, is there anything else I left out? No, I just want to clarify the amendment that was made on March 7 by the full council. So exempted agricultural producers, but um, not only that in the agricultural reserve zone, but also throughout the county if their activities are um, affiliated with agriculture and farming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see that Councilmember Balcom. Thank you. Uh, as we discussed uh, two weeks ago, Bill 1822 has many unresolved issues. There were a lot of questions about the rebate program. We don't know how much the rebate will be. Uh, we also don't know. We don't. We don't know. Um, who is going to get these rebates um, and we don't know if they're going to go to the people who most need them and uh, we don't know how the county is going to communicate this program. What we do know uh, uh, is that the details of this program we may not be they might not be available until mid 2024 
and the actual rebates going out will be sometime after that. Uh, we also had a very lengthy discussion about the timing of the ban of use versus the ban of sale, which was unresolved. And we also had a debate about whether larger recreational facilities might be exempt, which was also unresolved uh, after a very lengthy work session. This is a complex issue, and we need to make sure that we get this legislation done correctly and eventually pass a bill that addresses the needs of all stakeholders and make sure that the rebate program is something that works uh, well for the people who are most impacted. For this reason, I would like to motion, uh, make a motion to table the discussion on Bill 1822. Uh, Second. Uh, Councilmember Balcom is motion to table, seconded by Councilmember Sales. Uh, this is an immediate motion. All those in favor of tabling, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. That is seven. All those against? And that is four. The motion to table passes. This is off the table. And we'll now move on to the consent calendar. Mr. President. Uh, Councilmember Jondo, we're not talking about the bill. It's no longer on the table. Yeah, I'm just making a general comment. About the bill? <laughs> about the process. Uh, we're not in order right now. If you want to, we've just Par tabled it. Okay. I, you know, parliamentary we, inquiry. Uh, on inquiry? If you voted to table, only the people who voted to table can bring it off the table. Only the person who made the motion to table can bring it back. Ms. McCartney Green. The individuals that voted um, in the prevailing vote to table um, the bill are the ones that have the option to bring it back to the floor. Yeah, not not what the president, council president, just said because what you said is correct. That was incorrect. According to the rules of procedure. Yeah. Okay. Not the individual in who made the motion. Not no. the individual. Those that voted, voted in favor. There you go. So. so I look forward to that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have the consent calendar before us. May I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Um, Council Member Glass, yep. um, because of the vote that was taken on um, expedited bill 4-23, I respectfully request that uh, item, which one are you? Sorry, reading glasses. Which one? Five. Thank you, 5C, be removed from the consent calendar so that we may take a separate vote so that we can vote consistently with our earlier vote on the bill. Okay. Thank uh, you. We can remove item number C. Uh, so the consent calendar will reflect items A, B, D, E, and F, and we'll come back to item C. Uh, uh, do I have a motion for the revised consent calendar? Motion to approve. Uh, moved by Councilmember Ludke, seconded by Council Vice President Fritz, and all those in favor of the amended consent calendar. That is unanimous. Uh, and now, Councilmember Ludke, item number C, do you want to speak about it? No, I think I kind of already did. <laughs> well, we, no, we removed it. So I, we uh, removed it, at, and, and it, in order to be consistent with our prior action, we have to treat that separately. There we go. So. Is there a motion to move item number C? I, I like move it. Move item yep. number C. Uh, moved by Council Member Albernaz, seconded by Council Member Stewart. All those in favor of uh, item number C? That is nine. All those opposed? And that is two. And number C passes. With that, we are in recess. Thank you very much.